All right, so good morning to you all. Happy Wednesday. Hope you had a good uh, Veterans Day holiday. Um, today, we're actually going to spend our last day in kind of the AutoCAD realm, and then we move into SketchUp next week. Um, remember, of course, that SketchUp, most of you have already played around with SketchUp, so uh, SketchUp's going to be focused more on collage work out of SketchUp, getting it not to look like SketchUp anymore. Um, so we'll, we'll go through a little bit of the basics of SketchUp, but a lot of it I think you guys will pick up pretty quick um, as we go forward. But today we're going to continue with one more day of AutoCAD, and the purpose today is to go through kind of post-processing techniques uh, on your AutoCAD file. And the reason that this is important is we, we do our drawings in AutoCAD or we get an AutoCAD drawing ready uh, and then we have to think about what does it really look like when you go to print it out and put it on the wall? What does it look like when you go to show it on a projector? And how do we make it really stand out and read well? So this is not something that is particularly done in practice when you're doing a set of working drawings. So let's say I, was, I put together construction drawings, I'm going to hand them off to a contractor to build something. We're not going to go through this effort of post-processing because it's about this is how you build the site. We barely consider line weights at that point. It's just about building documents. This is about selling your project to somebody. It's about causing somebody to get excited about your project. It's about a review. It's about standing in front of a design commission. Um, in your case, standing in front of a bunch of reviewers that are coming in to critique your work. So the better you can show your work, the better your review is going to be. Um, so this is really the, the fine grain look at how do we make our drawing look good uh, on the wall. The other thing that I'll cover today, which is part of your assignment 105, is actually printing a 24 by 36 sheet. Um, I think this is going away, but as of right now, it's still a student learning outcome that is required for this class. Therefore, I have to have you print, and I have to actually grade you on the fact that you print it. Uh, so you will all print. That is, of course, assuming that the plotters work, which is a big assumption. Um, plotters are notoriously finicky. They're difficult to deal with. Uh, you would think that it would be just as easy as hooking up any other printer, but for whatever reason, they break, they screw up, they, they do a lot of things uh, that are not printing your drawing. So um, I recognize that it's a challenge. That being said, I would strongly encourage you to print earlier rather than later. If you show up, I forget what day the assignments actually do. Um, if you show up on the day that it's due and try to print in the morning before class, it won't work. I promise you it won't work. Something will go wrong and you won't have it. So print a few days before. Even if you make changes after the fact, that's fine with me. Heck, you could print today with whatever you have. That's okay too. Uh, just attempt the print. Um, and you know, fingers crossed that it'll work. Uh, so I'll go through that at the end of lecture today. I'll talk you through how to print uh, and what the strategies are there so that you can actually print. Um, I actually, uh, I've learned that uh, in 220, which is the next level studio for a lot of you in the architecture uh, department, a lot of the presentations are now going to digital where you'll, you'll create the board, you'll create the 24 by 36 board, but instead of printing it, you'll project it. Uh, which is really kind of a nice way of doing it. That necessitates a few changes on our end in terms of how things look. And when you're preparing for a projected presentation versus a printed pre presentation, it doesn't hurt to put it up on a projector and see what it looks like as you're, as you're working through it. Because you'll find that what you see on the monitor and what you see on the projector vary greatly. Uh, and so you might end up changing some of your colors to what they were going to look how they're going to look on the projector rather than what is actually uh, it looks like on the screen. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up the AutoCAD file from last class. Actually, this is, uh, for me, this is a couple semesters ago. Uh, I already have it laid out, so I'm going to use this one uh, as the example for today. But this is already set up in our paper space. We already have, just like last class, we already have our um, 24 by 36 sheet set up. It's set to print as a PDF, so everything looks pretty good. This is also a point where you could go in and you could make some corrections if something wasn't turning out quite correct or whatever. Some of you didn't quite get to this place last class, so you'll be finishing up today and making sure that you get the 24 by 36 with your plan and your four elevations. So I have my plan and my four elevations. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and just print the drawing in AutoCAD. So I'll click the plotter icon or the printer icon here. All of the default options that are available here are pre-set up because I did my layout setup 
ahead of time in paper space. So all I have to do is say OK. So everything's already set up. I just say OK. And I choose where I want it to save. So I'll go ahead and shave it into today's folder. And it will write the, the PDF document. No, I'm not going to restart my computer with the update. Um, and at that point, I have on my flash drive, of course it's not open here, I have a PDF file that is um, this, this particular drawing. And let's see where it is. Right there. So it's a PDF file. If I were to double click on this, it would open up, by default, it would open up in Acrobat. And I could see my drawing and say, OK, yeah, it's there. That's great. The cool thing about this particular PDF is AutoCAD, when it writes the PDF, actually creates a live set of lines. So if, instead of opening it in Acrobat, which is the default, I open up Illustrator, and I would encourage you to open Illustrator first, and then go in Illustrator File Open, rather than uh, trying to right click, which is an option, and saying Open With here, and then finding Illustrator. Sometimes it's not in the list or whatever. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I already have Illustrator open. I'm going to go ahead and go to File, and then Open, and I'll open up my AutoCAD drawing there. So with this AutoCAD drawing open, I can press Control-0 in Illustrator to see the whole uh, page, or the whole artboard. Uh, there are some weird artifacting things that are happening on this computer, and I'm not really sure why uh, they're showing up like this. But certain lines aren't quite appearing. So like these lines exist in here, but they're not showing up like the rest of the lines. So I'm going to investigate that in a little bit. Um, but we'll get there. The other thing that I wanted to point out before we move forward is sometimes in Illustrator, you go to open your page and it shows up on its side. And so this might happen to some of you, so it's worth going through it just in case. Uh, for, my, for me, it ended up showing up in its correct orientation, so that's fine. I don't have to do anything. I can just start working. If it shows up on its side like this, we need to make a correction. And in Illustrator, making this correction is unfortunately a little bit more difficult than it should be in that we can't just say rotate the page. What we do is Illustrator has something set up called an artboard. That is essentially the page, but they call it an artboard. And the reason that it's called an artboard is because you can have multiple artboards within the same drawing. So you can have blow ups of certain drawings. Uh, and when you export, you could export all the artboards at once. It's a more complicated setup. But uh, because of that, we have to control the artboard separate from the uh, content. So if I'm, if I'm in Illustrator, and I come down here on the toolbar, right toward the bottom is like a page. It looks like a document with a little crosshairs on one corner. It's called the Artboard Tool. And if I click on the Artboard Tool, I have nothing selected. You can see that it selects this 01 Artboard 1, kind of in this blue color. And then in my Properties on the right side here, I can actually change to Landscape Orientation from Portrait Orientation. So I can click right there to Landscape. And it changes my page to landscape orientation. It doesn't change the content on the page. That's the unfortunate thing. So once I have the page set up in landscape, I can go back to my black arrow, my selection tool. I can select everything. So I could drag a box around everything, or I could press Control A either way. And I'll move to one of the corners of my drawing, and I'll get that little uh, kind of double-ended arrow. That's going to let me rotate. If I hold down Shift, it will, it will jump to 45 and then to 90. And I can let go, and it's now oriented correctly. The good news is everything stays centered, so it's just a matter of changing the rotation. So you have to change the artboard and then change the content. And then you're set up like this and ready to go. So I already have one. I'm going to go ahead and not save that one. I already have one here that's set up in its correct orientation. Let's take a look at my layers. So right now I have one layer that controls the whole drawing. Underneath that layer, if I were to expand that layer, I have five clip groups. Each of these clipping groups corresponds to one of the viewports from AutoCAD. So if I were to click this, there's one elevation. On off, there's the second elevation. There's the third. There's the fourth. And finally, there's the fifth. So those are all little viewports. 
When Illustrator works with these viewports, it creates essentially a clipping group, uh, which is a bounding rectangle, and then all the content is inside of that rectangle. We don't need the sophistication of a clipping group because there's no content outside of the rectangle because it was exported from AutoCAD. It's just kind of an artifact of AutoCAD. So I'm going to release all of these clipping groups so that I can work with them a little bit better. That will make them plain groups instead of uh, clip groups. So I'm going to select uh, the, the layer itself right here. I'll start with this first one. I'll come up to the three lines in the upper right corner of the layers palette and I'll say release clipping mask. And it'll change from a clip group to a group. I'm going to do that for all of the layers. Release clipping mask. Next one, release clipping mask. Next one, release clipping mask. Next one here, release clipping mask. Perfect. So now they're all just groups, which makes it a lot, a lot simpler to work with. So if I click on any one of them, it selects it as a group. I could uh, rename these so that they'd be a little bit more intuitive. So I could say, let's call this instead of group, this could be floor plan. Uh, this is, let's see, the south elevation. No, this is the north elevation, sorry. I'm just going to call it north. That one is the east. This one, I believe, is the south, yep. And this would be the west. I may have messed those up, but anyway. Um, the labels sometimes help you just kind of know where, where certain drawings are, etc. So all of this is my primary layer. I'm going to call the main layer here original drawing. Now, do I have to rename these layers? No, I just think it really helps with the organization if you spend a little bit of time and rename the layers. So I have my original drawing layer. I'm going to create a copy of the whole original drawing layer so that I can work on a layer and not worry about messing it up. So I'm going to select the main layer itself, click on the little uh, three lines in the upper right corner, and say duplicate original drawing, and there it is. So I now have the original drawing copy. I'm going to call this a working drawing like that. I will move it below the original drawing in the layer stack. Then I will turn off the original drawing and I will lock it so that I can't change it at all. So I preserve my original drawing and now I go to work on these particular pieces. So at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and go in and take a look at a few of the lines that I was having trouble with. I believe that this is just a display issue. I don't think it's a problem with the AutoCAD export, but I'm going to double check. So whenever I click on one of these uh, views, so here I am in the north elevation, when I click on it, it selects everything because it's part of a group. If I double click on that group, it will go into something called group isolation mode, which grays out, if I were to zoom out, it grays out the other drawings and won't really let me work on those, but it will let me work on this one particular group. So let me zoom in here again. I'm going to select several of these lines and check on their properties. We go over to properties here. Oh, it does look like maybe the line strokes were off a little bit. So let me select them all. Uh, and it might be easiest to just go ahead and select all the lines of the same color. So I'll click on that. I'll go up to select. And then I'll go to same. And we'll do stroke color right there, and that should select all of my siding lines right there. Yep, they're all selected. And then I can come over to the stroke and I can adjust the width here. Um, so let's do it at maybe 0.1 point and take a look. Eh, maybe, maybe a little more of that. Let's try 0.2. There we go. Can you even see that? Yeah, you can. Uh, it's still look, it looks better on my end. You guys still see a little bit of artifacting in here. Um, I could go back and do that one more time. So select same stroke color, and I could say maybe 0.25. Remember that we're in different units than we were in last time.
So we're in points this time. In AutoCAD, we're in millimeters. So the, the, the weights don't necessarily correspond. Uh, the other thing I could do is I could say, you know what, I wanted the ground to be a little bit thicker. So I could select that and I could say, I want that to be thicker. Let's do it at uh, 2.5. And I could make that a little bit thicker. Let me press Control-0 to zoom out. Uh, and we can kind of see that drawing. I can back out of the group isolation mode by clicking this back one level, which gets me back into the main drawing itself. I could go in and I could make the same corrections for these other layers as well. I'm not going to do it right now, but I'm, I am pointing out that you can make these corrections um, in the Illustrator file as opposed to in the AutoCAD file. You could also go back to AutoCAD and make the corrections and re-export it. You get to the same place. So when we're looking at the floor plan, we'll start with the floor plan here for a second. As I look at the floor plan, this doesn't always read as well on the screen or when we go to print it because the walls are hollow. So they're just white inside. It's just a true line drawing. I can enhance this typically by doing a little bit of fill inside of those walls. So I'm going to walk you through how to do that fill. I'm going to make sure that I am working on the working drawing, which is good. And I'm going to do a live paint of this particular group. The good news is, because it's already a group, all I have to do is click on the group, and then I can go in and make the live paint of it. So I'll click on the group. I'll go to Object, uh, Live Paint, Make. That makes it a live paint group. My little um, size icons around the corner of the bounding box here turn to have the little stars in them. That means they're a live paint group. And then I can choose the Live Paint tool, which is probably... Um, hidden on me. There it is, Live Paint Bucket. I can also press K to get to it. Like that, there's my Live Paint Bucket. And now I can fill in various parts of this um, shape. So let's start with the walls. And I like to, when I'm doing this, I like to pick colors because it makes it easier to see what I'm filling in and then change it after the fact. So I'll change it to black or gray after the fact, but I'll fill it with colors. So I'm going to go ahead and start with this red color, and I'll fill in the walls. And this is actually a good strategy, especially if the hatches weren't working for you. Uh, you can do this after the fact in Illustrator pretty easily. So I'll go through and I'll pick my walls. To move around, I'm just holding down spacebar to be able to pan. And one more line right there, and then these guys. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the whole thing. There, those are all selected in red. Now, I'm also going to paint in where the floors would be. But I've got a few threshold problems. So I've got outside here, but then the inside of the door is being uh, done. So if I wanted to, to fill the floor on the inside different from the floor on the outside, I need to make a change. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my pen tool. I've done this before. I'm going to press Control plus to zoom in. And I'm going to draw a line that separates. Oops. That. And I'll draw one more line right here that separates this. We'll go like that. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to zoom out. And then in order to do the live paint, I need to actually merge those two new lines in. So I'll select all of them. Oh, I don't need the lower lines here. Select them all like that. I'll go up to Object, Live Paint. Oh, and looks like I don't have to do Merge because I included it in the group already. Sometimes you have to do that. Um, and let me go back to my Live Paint. And there we go. Yeah, I have flexibility again. I'm going to change my color before I paint. And I'll paint the exteriors in one color. Then I'll come back, change the color. And I'll paint the interiors. Like that. And so now I have the interiors painted like that. 
When I'm done with all of the live paints, which I now am, I'm going to go over to the properties and I'm going to let me make sure it's selected there. I'm going to click on the expand button here and the quick actions. And when I click on that expand button, it essentially blows apart the live paint and would allow me to, with the direct select tool, select just the shape that is a particular color. So I could select just that shape or just that shape or just that shape, etc. So what I'll do is I'll pick one of the colors. So we'll pick this teal color. I'll go to select same fill color. That selects all of the teal. And then I'll create a new layer. And we'll call this new layer uh, interior floor. And I will move the teal objects onto the interior floor layer like that. So there's the interior floor objects. Next thing I'll do is I'll select my walls. So I'll go to the direct select. I'll select one of the walls. Doesn't want to let me do it, so let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. I'll go to select and then same fill color again. And these are now going to be the walls. So I'll create a new layer called walls. And I'll move those walls onto the walls layer and I could turn them off. Last thing would be the exterior. So I'll create a new layer. We'll call this exterior floor. And I need to select same fill color. And we'll move that onto the exterior floor layer there as well. So if I press control minus, I can zoom out and I can see my drawing here. I have the floors, the walls, and the exterior floors all on separate layers. I'll move them down below here so that you can see them a little better. So when I turn on, say, the walls, oops, like that, you can see that I'm highlighting where the walls are. Now, I probably don't want my walls to be red, so now's my opportunity to change the color of the walls. I can select all of the objects on the walls layer by clicking over here, not the circle, but right next to it, and it will select all the objects on that layer. Alternatively, I could use the direct select tool, select one of the walls, like I've been doing, if it'll let me. There we go. And say, select same fill color. Either way will get us there. All right, now it's time to adjust those. So I could start by just making the walls black. So I could change the walls to be black. And you can see that already that floor plan is reading a lot better. Uh, this is especially important if you're going to end up projecting a floor plan. So on something like this on the screen, having the black walls really helps them read. Um, if your floor plan is small, generally black walls help a lot. If your floor plan is big, like it's a quarter inch equals a foot, the black walls are too thick and they, they dominate the drawing too much. So it depends kind of on the scale and how big your floor plan is as to whether you want to fill them in in black. Now the other option that we have is instead of filling them in with black, we could fill them in with some shade of gray. So I could pick a lighter shade of gray, or I could come over here and type in a value for K. So I could say maybe I want 30% gray to fill in those walls. And now those walls are filled in, but not as strongly filled in. And so you can kind of tell the difference. So there's one uh, in its light gray. Let me duplicate the layer, and I'll show you them against each other. All right, so there it is in all black. You can kind of get a sense for how that reads. And there it is in gray. So it's a different look. And you, as a, as a designer, have to decide how much you want to emphasize those walls or de-emphasize those walls. And it's a choice. OK, sometimes you want to show the interior floors or the exterior floors as uh, a lighter gray so that you can kind of tell this is interior, this is exterior. So let me turn on the interior floors. I'll select those. And I could change that shade. Now, I'm working primarily with gray. I think it would be a little weird to have the floors colored. So I think using a gray is a good place to start. Um, so let's say maybe 30% um, gray here. And we can fill in those floors slightly. That emphasizes what's on the interior of the building versus what's on the exterior of the building. That can be a good look. Now, if I had those on and I had those on, it really doesn't help. So it works because my walls are different than what my floor is. 
that helps to read. You could do the inverse where you could leave the walls white. Sometimes that works as a strategy. So again, this is all a, a look. You're kind of deciding what that look should be. And maybe this gray ends up being too dark and you want to lighten up that gray a little bit more. Maybe you'd only do it at a 10% gray. I don't even know if it'll show up on the projector, but let's try it. Yeah, you guys can't see it as well. I can see it on the screen. It's a very faint gray. It might be nice. So that's a strategy that I've used in the past to kind of emphasize what's building and what's outside the building. Um, and in, in this, it actually looks pretty good. Let me try on the screen. Let me adjust it to a 20% and let's take a look here. Maybe you guys can see it a little bit better. Yeah, like that. Okay. So again, it's all about the look and what it feels like for you. Um, that Even that works a little bit. It's a little more subtle to have the walls a different color. So you figure out what that balance is um, for you such that it shows your building nicely. So the other thing that I've found is that sometimes the computer colors are just flat. Like there's not a lot of variation to them. It doesn't feel like there's enough craft in them. Uh, and that's where there are actually um, some brushes or excuse me some swatches available on the course website and I forgot to log in but if you go to resources and you go to swatches I have these Prismacolor sets. I think I mentioned those to you guys in the past. Uh, like I said I'm not logged in but there are gray sets that have this kind of streaky pattern to them. And you can use that as a fill, which sometimes softens your drawing a little bit. So if I wanted to do that, I had to come back here in Illustrator. I need to open the brushes or the swatches palette. Let me go to Window and then Swatches. There we go. Uh, and then I need to load those swatches. So I'll click the little um, three lines in the upper right corner. I'll say Open Swatch Library, Other Library. I have these already saved on my flash drive. So under Resources. Uh, I think they're under Illustrator. There's my swatches. And there is my warm grays. I'm going to load the Illustrator one because this is the one that has the markers with it. And we'll go ahead and say open. There it is. And now on, on say, the interiors here, I could select those interiors and I could use one of the ones with the marker streaks. Uh, it might be hard for you guys to see it on the screen, uh, but it just softens it up a little bit. Um, so they're presets. These were designed based on the actual Prismacolor markers, colors. So if you were to go in and hand color these, you would get a similar effect. That was the idea. Um, so the colors should be pretty close. But again, we're not color matching on the monitor, so it's a little, little tricky. So I've worked through and I've decided what I think the, the good look would be on this drawing. Now, ultimately, I'm going to turn off my working drawing and turn on my original drawing, which gets rid of those extra lines that I added. It just kind of cleans it up a little bit. Uh, and so that's an advantage. I'm going to turn that back off, turn back on my working drawing, and we'll move over to the elevation view. So when it comes to the elevation view, we have to kind of decide the same thing. What, is, what should we collage? What shouldn't we collage? Uh, should we fill in part of the elevation in a particular color? Should we not? Um, on, say, something like this, maybe we want to fill in um, part of the elevation in gray, part of it in lighter gray. That's certainly a strategy. So I could take this drawing here. Whoops, sorry. I could take this drawing here. I could go up to Object, Live Paint, Make. There it is. And I could paint. And again, I'm always, oops, that was not what I wanted. Sorry, I need the live paint tool. There we go. And then I could paint with a particular color. And I could fill in, say, this elevation. I should have picked one of the elevations without all the little sighting marks on it. But you guys get the idea. When I'm done, once again, I go back to Properties, click the Expand button. I'll use my direct select, my white arrow, to select that fill right there. I'll go to select and then same fill color. 
with all of those selected, I'll move them onto their own layer. So I'll click create a new layer. This will be the, um, we'll call it siding. I'll move those onto the siding layer. And then I'll change those to have a particular color to them, something like that. You guys get the idea. But I don't want you to have to sit here and watch me fill all of those pieces in. What about if we have a wall that's dominated by windows, like this? What could we do with those? Well, we could start by coloring the windows. So I could go in, same strategy here, where I select using the regular selection tool, my group. Then I could create a live paint, so object, live paint, make. Then I could go in with the live paint bucket tool, and I could paint using kind of a light blue where all the glass would be. Like that. When I'm done, same thing. I'll go over to properties and I'll click on expand. I'll use my direct select, my white arrow to select one of these and say select same fill color. We'll move them over onto their own layer. So I'll create a new layer. And this was my uh, north windows. And we'll move them there. There they are. Now I can control these north windows and what they look like. So I could start by just taking all of those and making them a more attractive shade of blue. So I could pick something a little bit lighter, maybe a little bit darker, something like that. And I could say, okay, now they're all windows and they're reading as windows. It's amazing how much lighter it is on my uh, screen than it is on what you guys see. And so maybe that's enough. The other option though, would be to actually collage in some kind of a picture of clouds behind, which sometimes is a nice look. It adds a little bit of a gradient to it. So in that scenario, I'm gonna, for clarity purposes, I'm gonna turn everything off except for these north windows. And if I were to look at the north windows, I have a group here and I have a bunch of individual paths that represent my, um, all my little ob objects on this layer. If I select them all, I can make them into one compound object so I can join them all together essentially and I'll do that by going up to object compound path make you can also press control 8 on the keyboard and it makes them into one compound path you see on my my um, layer now instead of having all those individual pieces it's just one compound path that's what we're after so I have one path next I need a picture of some clouds so I could do a creative common search And we'll go ahead and search. And so I'm just looking for a cloudy sky that I like. Load some more here. Maybe something like that. Okay, so I, once I have that and I like it, I'm going to go ahead and download it. Let me go ahead and save image as. And I will put it on my flash drive in today's folder, get a new folder. I actually have a bunch of skies that I've downloaded over time on my flash drive in my resources folder, so I don't have to go look for them every time. But there it is. Next thing I need to do is bring it in. So I'm back to Illustrator, I'll go to File and then Place. And I will, there's today's folder, there's the clouds, and I will paste that in right there. So I need on my, my layers here, I need the linked file to be below the compound path. So it's always compound path on top, linked file below. When it's set up that way, if I select the main layer itself, click the little um, three lines to fly out, I can say make clipping mask, and it will cut out the picture for my um, clouds. It's kind of like in InDesign when you make the compound path and then you place the file in. 
Uh, we actually discovered that if you're trying to place like individual pictures in lots of these squares, it's easier to bring it over into uh, InDesign and do the placing in InDesign. Um, so you can copy it and then move it over. Anyway, so this can be a strategy. I can adjust the, uh, the background image a little bit to see a little bit more of the clouds, maybe something like that. And then I can turn back on the original drawing and we can see where there's clouds where the windows would be. Now maybe those clouds are a little bit strong. I could select those, go into my properties, and under the opacity here, I could change them to maybe be 60%, and they've just lightened up a little bit. You want to make sure that they're not too dominant. I think that's one of the mistakes people make when they do collage work, is that the colors end up being too dominant and you don't see enough of the drawing or enough of the line weights to really read. So at this point, I have um, that elevation done. I have my, uh, I'm going to turn off the siding. I have my interior floor, my walls. I, I didn't do the exterior floor. I don't think I need to, but again, I did the live paint so that I could do that if I wanted to. Uh, and I would go through and I would touch up the other elevation views as well. Again, this is a matter of editing. Could I collage in all the materials? Could I put concrete on the walls? Sure, I could do that. But you have to decide how much is too much. Really, this is about letting the drawings read and having a subtle clue about, oh, that's window. Or, oh, that's, that's concrete and that's a different material. Something like that. Sometimes thinking of it as materials is a good strategy. Uh, we also want to make sure the floor plan is clear and easy to read. In this case, I think it's nice and clear and easy to read. So once I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and go to File and then Save. Now the interesting thing here is we've been working in a PDF the whole time. So even though we're an Illustrator file, or even though we're working in Illustrator, it's always been the PDF. So it's not an AI this time. It's just uh, a PDF. So I can go to File and then Save and it will just save the PDF. I don't have to do anything fancy. There it is saving the PDF file. There we go. So if I were to close this drawing in Illustrator, and I went back to the drawing here, if I double click on that drawing, it will open back up in Adobe Acrobat with the changes that I've made, ready to print. So I'm still in the PDF the whole time. So at this point, it's a matter of, of actually going ahead and printing this drawing. And so this is where I'm going to talk you through kind of the printing process here. Um, so there are two plotters. Hopefully one of them will be working for us. Um, theoretically, you can print using the GoPrint server just like you do to any of the rest of the printers. And that's how I'm going to demonstrate it. Uh, in practice, sometimes it's easier to find the cable, the USB cable that's attached to the back of the printer and plug it into a computer that's close by and print directly to the printer and bypass the GoPrint server. I'm not supposed to tell you that, but it generally works better. So if you're struggling, if it's not showing up on GoPrint, sit in one of those back four computers on the left side here. The plotter's right behind you. T find the USB cord that's gray and plug it into the computer and then print directly from there. Okay. Alternatively, in the other lab, the plotter is the same way, but you have to run the USB cord through the little glass window and then use one of the computers that's close by. Some of you are nodding like you've done it before. Um, so that's a, that's a good strategy. Okay, so when I go to print, I've opened this up in uh, Acrobat. I'll go to File and then Print. And under Printer here, I have to look for the T520C. And in this case, it's the 116T520C. The reason it's that one is because this is the printer in the other lab that's actually hooked up to GoPrint. That one's hooked up to Air. So you're not going to find that one on GoPrint. You actually have to plug that one in. Um, so you have to use that other strategy. So once I've selected the printer, if we look at the page size, we see that it's only 8.5 by 11. Well, that's not the size we want, so I need to change the page size. So right here under Page Sizing and Handling, we'll click on the Size button. Maybe. Well, apparently it doesn't want us to do it that way. Let's go into properties and see if it'll do it that way. There we go. Uh, we'll switch to properties first. So I clicked on this properties button. And then under paper options here, under document size, um, the arc D, which is the size, the 24 by 36, isn't listed. So if you click on more, you can find it in... There it is, Arc D, right there. And you'll go ahead and say OK. 
So once arc D is set up there, we need to make sure, and we're kind of seeing a preview, it's printing off of a roll of paper. So we need to make sure that it's printing in its correct orientation. So let's see here. They might have an arc D transposed. Hold on. No, they don't. Okay, we'll find we'll figure out how to change it. These things always move around on me. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just click on this custom. There should be an ability to rotate it. Layout. There we go. Uh, landscape. There we go. I knew it was here somewhere, just the wrong tab. Okay, so I went from paper and quality. I picked the arc D. Then I went to layout and output. And right there, I chose landscape. So we're looking at the roll, and we're, it's showing us where we're going to cut it and how it's going to come out of the printer. It's important that you do it this way. Otherwise, you end up with a blank white streak on the side because the roll is 36 inches wide. Okay, so I have that part set up. I'm going to go back uh, under resizing options. It's set to actual size. I'm going to confirm here under paper quality. Uh, yep, all that's good. We're going to use the printer settings for the paper type and the paper source. It should already be set up in the printer, so we don't have to worry about it. Under your print quality here, um, if you were printing something as like a final draft, you would up the quality to make it better. For our purposes, speed is just fine. This is on bad paper, and it's not going to look that great, but it's proof that you can print, which is what I need. Okay, so all of that's set up. Um, it's Sometimes it's useful to go through the rest of the tabs and make sure there aren't any other options that we need to go through. We are printing in color. That's good. Uh, we don't worry about any of that. Under advanced, all of that's fine. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And it should update to 24 by 36 right there. One more time here, we need to print actual size. If you shrink your pages to fit, it's going to shrink your document down a little bit. And when we shrink that document down, it's not going to be to the correct scale anymore. OK? So we want to make sure it's set to actual size. Once all of that's done, you'll go ahead and print the pre press the print key, and it will send it to the printer. You can go put your card key in and pay your 25 cents or whatever, or it'll send it directly to the printer and start printing, which is good. So I'm not going to print it for us. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. And I'm going to come back and keep working with this drawing a little bit more. But I wanted to make sure that I showed you that uh, before I forgot. So I'm going to go back into Illustrator. I'm going to open this one up. I'm going to go to File and then Open, and we're going to continue to enhance this a bit more. OK, so I have the drawing set up. I like how they look. Now it's time to start thinking about labels, text, graphics, those kinds of things. So I, I, always, I always believe when I'm working on a drawing that I do triage. I always say, let me get so that the drawing is, is good enough to use. And then let me go back and add some more detail. Let me go back and add some more uh, pieces. And so you may argue that, oh, no, you need labels on the elevations for it to be finished. No. Do you really? If you have good quality drawings, the line weights are good, and you have it on the wall, and you don't have the labels on, your review is still going to go just fine. So you always get to the point where you're ready to put it on the wall, and then come back and add more. So in our, in our scenario here, I'm going to start working through what I want the labels to look like, what I want the fonts to look like, et cetera, for this particular drawing. So one of the things that people have a tendency to do is they look here uh, at the building, uh, and they say, OK, well, I need to label this. This is the north elevation, so I need to label it. So let me come over here into my text, and I'll create a, uh, well, let me create a layer for text here. And they say, OK, this is great. Let me say, this is north elevation. All right, and so they put that label in like that. And they say, oh, man, you know, it's kind of small. Like, I need to be able to see it. So they take this, and they say, OK, let's, let's change the properties. And let's say, oh, I don't know, 150. Yeah, OK, that's good. And they put these, these labels on it that are like this. Okay? This happens. I'm not exaggerating. People do this on their drawings. Okay? When you do this, and you print that label, it looks fine on the screen. It's going to be like three inches tall on your drawing. And so when it's hanging on the wall, what are people going to look at? The, that big text. 
So I'm serious when I say no font larger than about 18 point, max. I would feel better at 16 or even 14. So it can be a little bit big, but take that and really shrink it down. If somebody really needs to know what the label says on your drawing, make them get close. Make them look from a foot out, because then they're going to see new stuff in your drawing that's more interesting. Don't throw the label up there that's gigantic. So let's come down here. Let's maybe make it at 18 point and take a look. Yeah, that feels a lot better. I would say rule of thumb, no larger than 18. So now I have that north elevation. I have to decide, do I want it on the left side? Do I want it on the right side? Do I want it close to my ground line? Not. So I have that one there. Copy, paste. I put it over here. This was my south elevation. Like that. OK, it's starting to feel pretty good. The next thing we talked, we spent a whole lecture talking about fonts and typography. Make sure that you pick a font that seems appropriate. In this case, this is not a particularly bad choice. It's pretty generic, but it's, it's reasonable. So if you're, if you're struggling, stick with Arial. <laughs> when in doubt, use Arial. That's fine. Um, there are some architectural style fonts, like City Blueprint and Country Blueprint, that AutoCAD installs by default. They're not the best. Uh, they tend, tend not to look too good. If you really want an architectural style font, uh, I have one. I use it very frequently. I think it looks good. Uh, it's called Frank the Architect. If you do a Google search, you can get it for free. The basic version is free. Uh, let's see here. There it is. Um, it looks kind of like a hand-lettered architectural font. It's the best I've found to use. And I, I use it very frequently. Uh, I actually paid for the premium version, so I have the, the bold version and the, the italicized version, et cetera. But you can get this one for free, and there's no reason not to do it. Uh, if you want to install it on the computer, you need to download it. Um, I have a uh, folder on my flash drive in my resources folder right here under fonts. You can see that I have a, a variety of them that I have. Uh, let's see, where is Frank the Architect? There it is. And those are all of them. Do I have just the regular one? There, that's the regular one. Uh, and you can just double click on it and click on Install. Uh, these computers have been updated, so we don't have to use any uh, major hoops to install them. You just click on Install, and it installs. Uh, and that then allows you to change your fonts. So I could select this, and I could change to Frank the Architect. There it is. And it's a little bit more architectural. Again, it's not huge. Small is good. Uh, and so that might be something that you're after. Now, sometimes you want um, scales. You know, so you can see a graphic bar scale of your drawing. I have some that are available on the course website uh, that you can download. I have all of them on my, um, I think it's under downloadable resource packages. And of course, it's all blocked out because I didn't. Yeah, there's the Frank the Architect. So you can click on the link. It's one of these. Uh, and you can download those, and they show up as a zip file. And I have them in resources and then in Illustrator. Uh, and I have them here in the title blocks folder. Uh, and I have drawing notes. I have drawing scales. Uh, and you can use any one of these. Let me open up the, uh, we're again, we're working in quarter inch equals a foot. So I'll use the quarter inch scale. Uh, drawing scale, I'll use the clean one here. If I want to bring that in, I just have to place it. So I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll go to my flash drive. That's why I just keep them on my flash drive. Uh, drawing scale, clean, quarter, right there. I have two different options. Let me go ahead and place this first one like that. And now that it's in the scene here, I can zoom in. And we see it's a, just a little graphic bar scale that shows us how big uh, our drawing is. And so we can choose to place it somewhere. 
um, so that we have an idea of scale. It's very simple. Uh, I have some other ones. So we can go to file and then place. Let's see here. Let's try the clean two. Uh, that one's just a little bit smaller. Same scale, but it doesn't stretch out as much. Uh, let's see here. There's the casual one. That one's a little bit, you know, just a little bit of a different style. Uh, and so you can set that one up. Uh, it's got little overage lines in it. So they're just different, different little graphic bar scales. We can use any one of them um, for our drawings. The idea here is that you would place that somewhere near your drawings. The other thing that you might do is I have one that is a, um, a title that also includes a bar scale. So you would, you would come in here, you would set your title, you can double click to get inside of this. Oh, I have to embed it to get access to it. There we go. And you would say this is, I forget what elevation this is, this is the um, east elevation. And so that one's kind of baked into the title itself. Just a different strategy, etc. cetera. Um, any one of these is fine. You can just create your own. There's no reason you have to use mine. You don't have to include a bar scale. Sometimes people like to include a bar scale. Again, it's a, it's a matter of preference. Uh, the ones that I have prepped, I think, are eighth and quarter for you. So in, in some very, very rare circumstances, you can get away with larger text. Um, and sometimes it looks nice. I'll show you how that typically is done, um, just so that you can know, because you will end up seeing it. Like if you look at Alex Holgreff's work, that's a good place where you would end up seeing it. Uh, what they do is instead of having just the line here at the bottom of the elevation, they use a color fill, they use a block. It works nice in section too, when you have a, uh, something where you've filled it in. So first thing I need to do is create that colored block. So I think, let me go back to my working drawings. There's my working drawing so I could actually work with this. I'm going to get inside the group here and there's that line that represents the, the dirt, so to speak. I'm going to go ahead and use my pen tool. Start on this point. I'll come straight down to there. I'll come straight over to there and I'll come straight back up to there. And instead of having an outline, I'll switch and have it just be a fill. So I'm feeling what's happening in the bottom. Now, if I were to look at this, it's pretty stark because it's such a strong black. So I would change this to be a much, much lighter gray. And I'd say maybe a 20% gray. So let me go 0, 0, 0, and then 20. And let's try that. So in that scenario, it's a much lighter gray. And I think that works pretty nicely. I could then take the south elevation text. Let me get outside of my box here. I could, in this scenario, make it a little bit bigger. Maybe something like that. I'm going to change the color of the text to be white. So just by changing it to white, I've decreased the intensity. I'm not as focused on it. Uh, and then I would move it to be graphically part of this shape. So I'd have it kind of extend outside of the shape there a little bit and blend it together with that elevation view. So it's, you can get away with large text. You just have to do it in a subtle manner. So no big black text as an option. So if I came back here, um, I would turn back on my original drawing there. I would turn back off my working. Oh, I didn't make the, uh, the ground its own layer. So let me go ahead and select it. And we'll move that up onto the ground layer. All right, that allows me to turn off the working drawing. The reason that I worked on the working drawing and then I turned back on that original drawing is because I still want the line of the ground. I don't want to make that line go away. So I have the color fill, but it's below, or the gray fill, but it's below that, that line. So that's another strategy. It can be a successful strategy. It can look good. Uh, if we zoom back out, 
you can kind of see that the drawing still is dominant. We're still looking at the drawing and the text is subliminal because it's white and it's part of that light gray background. So it's not standing out. That's a key part of this. So I really want to emphasize that. I, hopefully I've beat it into you enough right now such that you won't make that mistake when you're in your studio classes. No large text ever. Okay, please, please, please. When I come to review, I don't want to see large text. Um, so this is essentially what we're doing today. Uh, I do have one other thing that you could place in. It's a title block that goes around your page. I've kind of gone away from using the title blocks. I'll show it to you just so that you can see it. Uh, there's a title block for the 24 by 36. And we could drop it in on the drawing here. And essentially what it does, I'm going to need to embed it so that I can make some changes. If I were to zoom in on it, you can see that it adds just a little border around your page. Uh, I think for presentation purposes, you rarely actually need a title block. Uh, I think working drawings, of course, you need a title block because you need to include information and notes and, and those kinds of things, what sheet number it is and all that kind of stuff. But for presentations, the idea of kind of formalizing it into a title block I think most of the time is unnecessary. So I would rather have you de-emphasize that. Don't worry about that for your, for your assignment. Um, but it is there should you, should you be interested in, in including it. Um, I think it's enough just to work through kind of the, the general collage and whatever. So stick with the grays. Concentrate on your fonts. Uh, concentrate on your size of your text and that sort of thing. Uh, and go from there. Are there any questions before I turn you guys loose? I know it was a lot to take in. Yeah. Yes. Is that something that you can add separate? You can add it separately. If you want to add it, you could draw it yourself. You don't have to use mine. Um, you know, title block is generally pretty simple. It's a border around your page. Uh, I would do it about, for these plotters, I'd do it about a half inch in from the outside of the page so that it shows up and doesn't get clipped. Um, and then typically in the lower right corner, you'd have a little bit of information about your uh, building, what drawing number it was, what the drawing title would be, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes you want to do it that way. Sometimes you want it formalized. I've done this. Um, my working drawing sets have a big bar that goes up the side because of all the information you're trying to include on the title block. Uh, my design sets, sometimes I would do just a little one running down along the bottom of the page just to say what the drawing title would be. Um, it depends a little bit on whether you're doing a big presentation where you've printed it and put it on the wall or you're doing an 8.5 by 11 or 11 by 17 packet that you're handing somebody, where each drawing is on a separate page. Sometimes um, it just depends on how you're trying to lay it out. Um, so again, the, this background is, is an optional thing. You can choose to include it. You can choose to not include it. Uh, it's, it's really a, it's up to you. Any other questions? That was a good one. No? OK. I'll give you the rest of the time today to work. We've got a couple hours to kind of finish things up. Uh, remember that your assignment 105 is due pretty soon. Do you guys remember when it's due? The 18th. Uh, the 18th? Okay. Is it the Wednesday before break? I think it's Monday. I don't remember. I apologize. I'll, I will look it up and, and confirm because I want to make sure that I don't give you the wrong information. Monday. Is it Monday? Okay. All right. So, yeah, it's due on Monday. Uh, that's good. Perfect. Nothing else? Go to work. I have a question now. Yeah. Does that let me uh, fill in these Okay, give me a second. <laughs>